The Adventures of Mullah Nasruddin Selections from the Nasruddin Corpus by Idris Shah The Legend of Nasruddin A certain crafty villain was entrusted with the education of a number of orphans. Observing that children have certain strengths and weaknesses, he decided to take advantage of this knowledge. Instead of teaching them how to acquire a skill in learning, he told them that they already possessed it. Then he insisted upon their doing some things and refraining from others, and thus kept most of them blindly subject to his direction. He never revealed that his original commission had been to teach them to teach themselves. When these children grew up, he noticed that some had detached themselves from his authority, despite all his efforts, while others remained bound to it. He was then entrusted with a second school of orphans. From these, he did not directly demand obedience and respect. Instead, he enslaved them to his will by telling them that mental culture was the sole aim of education and by appealing to their self-pride. The mind, he told them, will give you universal understanding. This must be true, thought the children. After all, why should we not be able to solve all problems by ourselves? He supported the doctrine by demonstrations. This man, he said, is enslaved by his emotions. What a disastrous case! Only the intellect can control the emotions. That other man, however, is ruled by his intellect. How much happier he is! How free from emotional frenzy! He never let the children guess that there was an alternative to the choice between emotions and intellect, namely intuition, which could, however, be overcome or blurred by either of these, and always dismissed its appearance as irrelevant coincidence or guesswork. There are two kinds of habit, one derived from mere repetition, the other from intuition harnessed both to the emotions and to the intellect. But since intuitive habit is associated with true reality, this villainous old man simply abolished it in favour of repetitive habit. Some of the children nevertheless suspected that certain miraculous aspects of life did not fit into his fragmentary pattern and asked him whether there was not, perhaps, something else undisclosed, some secret power. He told one group of questioners, Certainly not. Such a notion is superstitious and due to faulty mental processes. Do not put any value on coincidence. Coincidence means no more than accident, which, though perhaps of emotional interest, lacks all intellectual significance. To another group, he said, Yes, there is more to life than you will ever know, because it cannot be acquired by honest extension of the scientific information which I gave you, or which you managed to collect under my direction. But he took care that the two groups did not compare notes, and so realized that he had given two contradictory answers. Now, from time to time... When the children reported inexplicable events to him, he consigned these to oblivion as having no scientific relevance. He knew that, without taking stock of intuition, the children would never escape from the invisible net in which he had bound them, and that the intuitive knowledge of secrets excluded from their education could be won only when they were in a certain harmony of mind with the emotions. So he taught them to ignore variations in their mental condition, for once they discovered that powers of apprehension vary from hour to hour, they might guess how much he had concealed from them. His training confused their memory of such intuitions as they had been granted, 
and they were willing to think along the logical lines that he had prepared for them. The children whom this villain had mistaught in his first school were now grown up, and since he had let them come nearer to understanding the true nature of life, certain casual remarks that they made to members of the second school disturbed their faith in scientific truth. So he hastily gathered those of the first school who still remained loyal to him and sent them out to preach incomprehensible doctrines purporting to explain the hidden mechanism of life. Then he directed the attention of the second school to these teachers, saying, Listen carefully, but never fail to use your intellect. The intellectual children soon found that there was nothing to be learned from these doctrines, and said, They contradict logic. Only with logic are we on firm ground. Yet some members of the first school, who had broken away from the old villain's teaching, reproached them, saying, We too reject these doctrines, but that they fail to explain the secret mechanism of life of which you are in search does not deny its existence. They answered, Can you then put the secret in logical terms? but were told that to do so would be to deny its truth. So they protested, Nothing is true that cannot face the cold light of reason. A few, however, cried out, We are ready to believe everything you tell us. We think you are wonderful. But they were as hopelessly lost as the intellectual children and the teachers of the incomprehensible doctrine because they trusted only to a slavish credulity, not to the habit of intuition. A state of educative chaos supervened. So many different ways of thought were current that it was often said, I cannot trust anyone. I must find out for myself by the exercise of my supreme will. The old villain who had bred all this confusion thrived on it like a madman rejoicing in deeds of violence. Especially his cult of the intellect encouraged egotism and discord. And to those who still felt an inner uncertainty, a sense of incompleteness or a hankering for something whole and true, he said, Distract your minds by ambition. He taught them to covet honours, money, possessions, sexual conquests, to compete with their neighbours, to immerse themselves in hobbies and diversions of all kinds. It is said that when a horse cannot find grass, it will accept hay. For want of the green grass of truth, they accepted the dry hay with which he filled their mangers. The old man devised more and more distractions for them, Vogues, crazes, lotteries, fashions in art, music and literature, sporting competitions and all kinds of achievements which offered them temporary relief from this sense of lack. They were like a patient who accepts palliatives from his physician because he assures them that his disease is incurable. Or they were like the monkey and the crab apple. He clutched the crab apple inside a bottle but the neck was too narrow for him to withdraw his hand, and the crab apple too, unable to escape, because hampered by the bottle, he was soon captured and put into a sack. But he proudly cried, I still have the apple. The fragmentary view of life forced on mankind by the old villain was now accepted, and the few people who tried to point out where truth really lay were thought insane and readily refuted by the old argument, if what you say is true, then prove it to us logically. False coin is accepted only because true coin exists, and deep in their hearts many people knew this, but they were like children born in a house from which they had never been allowed to stray, doomed to walk from one room to another without knowing that there could be another house elsewhere with different furnishings and a different view from its windows. 
Nevertheless, the tradition that true coins exist, that there is another house, that some horses eat grass, not hay, survived in a book which was not a book, delivered by direct succession from an ancient sage to one of his descendants named Hussein. Hussein searched the world until he found the man who, through craft and guile, would give the teaching of this book fit expression, namely the incomparable Mullah Nasruddin. Thereupon this book, which was not a book, was interpreted by the actions of a Mullah, who was no Mullah, who was both wise and a fool, who was both a man and many men, and the teaching was thus brought to the attention of the children who had been misled. Mullah Nasruddin broke out of the net which had been cast by the old villain. For how can one burn a book which is not a book? How can one name a fool who is no fool? How can one punish a man who, who is oneself? Study the adventures of Mullah Nasruddin. Plumb the depth of the subtleties. He is like a tree which has nourishment in its roots and an edible sap, whose leaves are pot herbs, whose flowers, fruit, branches and seeds are all variously the same. Can a tree be a man, or a man a tree? How Nasruddin created truth. Laws as such do not make people better, said Nasruddin to the king. They must practice certain things in order to become attuned to inner truth. This form of truth resembles apparent truth only slightly. The king decided that he could and would make people observe the truth. He could make them practice truthfulness. His city was entered by a bridge. On this he built a gallows. The following day, when the gates were opened at dawn, the captain of the guard was stationed with a squad of troops to examine all who entered. An announcement was made. Everyone will be questioned. If he tells the truth, he will be allowed to enter. If he lies, he will be hanged. And Nasruddin stepped forward. Where are you going? I am on my way, said Nasruddin slowly, to be hanged. We don't believe you. Very well. If I have told a lie, hang me. But if we hang you for lying, we will have made what you said come true. That's right. Now you know what truth is. Your truth. Wife, thief and donkey. The mullah was tired of feeding his donkey. He asked his wife to do it, but she refused. And it all ended with a dispute in which they decided that whoever spoke first would feed the donkey. The mullah sat down stoically in a corner. His wife was soon bored and went to visit the neighbours. As supper time approached, she sent a boy with a bowl of soup for the mullah. In the meantime, a thief broke into the silent Nasruddin household. He stole everything he could see. As the mullah was sitting immobile and speechless, he even took the hat from his head. Then he left. Shortly afterwards, the boy with the soup arrived. Nasruddin tried to explain with gestures that a thief had been there, but all the boy could see was that he kept pointing agitatedly at his head, from which the hat had been removed. Taking the gesture as an order, the boy poured the soup on the mullah's head and went back to report the strange circumstances to the mullah's wife. She hurried home. Seeing all the doors open and the cupboards empty, she started to curse Nasruddin. Nasruddin said, Now go and feed the donkey, and look well at what you have achieved through your stubbornness. Whose shot was that? The fair was in full swing, and Nasruddin's senior disciple asked whether he and his fellow students might be allowed to visit it. Oh, certainly, said Nasruddin, for this is an ideal opportunity to continue practical teaching. The mullah headed straight for the shooting gallery, one of the great attractions, for large prizes were offered for even one bull's eye. 
At the appearance of the mullah and his flock, the townsfolk gathered around. When Nasruddin himself took up the bow and three arrows, tension mounted. Here, surely it would be demonstrated that Nasruddin sometimes overreached himself. Study me attentively, the mullah flexed the bow, tilted his cap to the back of his head like a soldier, took careful aim and fired. The arrow went very wide off the mark. There was a roar of derision from the crowd, and Nasruddin's pupils stirred uneasily, muttering to one another. The mullah turned and faced them all. Silence! At least it was a demonstration of how the soldier shoots. He is often wide off the mark. That is why he loses wars. At the moment when I fired, I was identified with the soldier. I said to myself, I am a soldier firing at the enemy. He picked up the second arrow, slipped it into the bow and tweaked the string. The arrow fell short, halfway towards the target. There was dead silence. Now, said Nasruddin to the company, you have seen the shot of a man who was too eager to shoot, yet who, having failed at his first shot, was too nervous to concentrate. The arrow fell short. Even the stallholder was fascinated by these explanations. The mullah turned nonchalantly towards the target, aimed, and let his arrow fly. It hit the very center of the bull's eye. Very deliberately, he surveyed the prizes, picked the one which he liked best, and started to walk away. A clamor broke out. Silence, said Nasruddin. Let one of you ask me what you all seem to want to know. For a moment, nobody spoke. Then a yokel shuffled forward. We want to know which of you fired the third shot. Oh, that! <laughs> oh, that was me! The Chickens Hardly anyone could understand Nasruddin, because sometimes he snatched victory from defeat, sometimes things seemed to go astray because of his blundering. But there was a rumour that he was living on a different plane from others. And one day, a young man decided to watch him, to see how he managed to survive at all, and whether anything could be learned from him. He followed Nasruddin to a river bank, and saw him sit down under a tree. The mullah suddenly stretched out his hand, and a cake appeared in it, which he ate. He did this three times. Then he put his hand out again, picked up a goblet, and drank deeply. The youth, unable to contain himself, rushed up to Nasruddin and caught hold of him. Tell me how you do these wonderful things, and, and I will do anything you ask, he said. I will do that, said Nasruddin, but first you have to get into the right state of mind. Then time and space have no meaning and you can be reaching out to the sultan's chamberlain to hand you sweetmeats. There is only one proviso. I accept it, shouted the young man. You will have to follow my way. Tell me about it. I can only tell you one thing at a time. Do you want the easy exercise or the difficult one? Or oh, I'll take the difficult one. This is your first mistake. You have to start with the easy one. But now you cannot, for you have chosen. The difficult one is this. Make a hole in your fence so that your chickens can get into your neighbor's garden to peck. Large enough for that. But it must also be so small that your neighbor's chickens cannot get into your own garden to feed themselves. The young man was never able to work this one out. And so he never became a disciple of Nazareth. 
But when he told people about what Nasruddin could do, they thought that he was mad. This is a good start, said Nasruddin. One day you will find a teacher. Saved his life. Nasruddin, when he was in India, passed near a strange looking building, at the entrance of which a hermit was sitting. He had an air of abstraction and calm, and Nasruddin thought that he would make uh, some sort of contact with him. Surely, he thought, a devout philosopher like me must have something in common with this saintly individual. I am a yogi, said the anchorite in answer to the mullah's question, and I am dedicated to the service of all living things, especially birds and fish. Pray allow me to join you, said the mullah, for, as I had expected, we have something in common. I am strongly attracted to your sentiment because a fish once saved my life. How pleasurably remarkable, said the yogi. I shall be delighted to admit you to our company. For all my years of devotion to the cars of animals, I have never yet been privileged to attain such intimate communion with them as you. Saved your life? This amply substantiates our doctrine that all the animal kingdom is interlinked. So Nasruddin sat with the yogi for some weeks, contemplating his navel and learning various curious gymnastics. At length, the yogi asked him, If you feel able, now that we are better acquainted, to communicate to me your supreme experience with a life-saving fish, I would be more than honoured. I'm not, I'm not sure about that, said the mullah, now that I've heard more of your ideas. But the yogi pressed him with tears in his eyes, calling him master and rubbing his forehead in the dust before him. Very well, if you insist, said Nasruddin, though I am not quite sure whether you are ready to use your parlance for the revelation I have to make. The fish certainly saved my life. I was on the verge of starvation when I caught it. It provided me with food for three days. Ask me another. According to the general opinion of the uninitiated, mused Nasruddin as he walked along the road, dervishes are mad. According to the sages, however, they are the true masters of the world. I would like to test one and myself to make sure. Then he saw a tall figure, robed like an Akeldan dervish, reputedly to be exceptionally enlightened men, coming towards him. Friend, said the mullah, I want to perform an experiment to test your powers of psychic penetration and also my sanity. Proceed, said the Akeldan. Nasruddin made a sudden sweeping motion with his arm, then clenched his fist. What have I in my hand? A horse, chariot and driver, said the Akeldan immediately. Well, that's no real test. Nasruddin was petulant. You saw me pick him up. Caught. The king sent a private mission around the countryside to find a modest man who could be appointed a judge. Nasruddin got wind of it. When the delegation, posing as travellers, called on him, they found that he had a fishing net draped over his shoulder. Why, pray? One of them asked, Do you wear that net? Merely to remind myself of my humble origins, for I was once a fisherman. Nasruddin was appointed judge on the strength of this noble sentiment. Visiting his court one day, one of the officials who had first seen him asked, what happened to your net, Nasruddin? 
There is no need of a net, surely, said the Mullah judge, once the fish had been caught. It takes one to know one. A practical joker challenged Nasruddin in the tea house. People say you are very clever, but I bet you a hundred gold pieces you can't fool me. I can. Just wait for me, said Nasruddin, and he walked out. Three hours later, the man was still waiting for Nasruddin and his trick. Finally, he conceded that he had been fooled. He went to the mullah's house and put a bag of gold as his forfeit through the window. Nasruddin was lying on his bed, planning his trick. He heard the chink of coins, found the bag, and counted the gold. Good, he said to his wife. Kind destiny has sent me something to pay my bet with if I lose. Now all I have to do is to think out some stratagem to fool the joker, who is no doubt impatiently awaiting me in the tea house. Shoes. A thief who specialized in stealing shoes followed Nasruddin one day. The mullah went into a mosque, sat down and started to say his prayers. Contrary to custom, he kept his shoes on. The thief who had sat down behind him was unable to resist intoning audibly, A prayer said with the shoes on does not abide. No muttered Nasruddin over his shoulder, but if the shoes abide, that is at least something. Duck Soup A kinsman came to see Nasruddin from the country and brought a duck. Nasruddin was grateful, had the bird cooked, and shared it with his guest. Presently, another visitor arrived. He was a friend, as he said, of the man who brought you the duck. Nasruddin fed him as well. This happened several times. Nasruddin's home had become like a restaurant for out-of-town visitors. Everyone was a friend at some removes of the original donor of the duck. Finally, Nasruddin was exasperated. One day, there was a knock at the door, and a stranger appeared. I am the friend of a friend of the friend of the man who brought you the duck from the country. He said, Come in, said Nasruddin. They seated themselves at the table, and Nasruddin asked his wife to bring the soup. When the guest tasted it, it seemed to be nothing more than warm water. What sort of soup is this? he asked the mullah. That, said Nasruddin, is the soup of the soup of the soup of the duck. Later than you think. Deciding for once to fast for the thirty days of Ramadan, Nasruddin thought he would keep count by putting one stone for every day into a pot. His little daughter, seeing her father do this, started to carry stones from all over the garden and put them in the pot too. Nasruddin knew nothing of this. A few days later, some travellers passed by, asking him, how many days of the fasting months had passed? Nasruddin hurried to his pot and counted the stones. Then he came back and said, Forty-five. There are only thirty days in a month. I do not exaggerate, said the mullah with dignity. Far to the contrary, the actual number is a hundred and fifty-three. Whose servant am I? Mullah Nasruddin had become a favourite at court. He used his position to show up the methods of courtiers. One day the king was exceptionally hungry. Some aubergines had been so deliciously cooked that he told the palace chef to serve them every day. Are they not the best vegetables in the world, Mullah? He asked Nasruddin. The very best, Majesty. Five days later, when the aubergines had been served for the tenth meal in succession, the king roared, Take these things away! I hate them! They're the worst vegetables in the world, Majesty, agreed Nasruddin. But Mullah, less than a week ago, you said they were the very best.
I did, but I am the servant of the king, not of the vegetable. Storage problem. A local gossip sought out the mullah. Can you keep a secret, Nasruddin? I am afraid that I have no space for any at the moment, said the mullah. You see, one has to protect oneself against other people's storage problems. Face the fact. <laughs> What's the matter, Nasruddin? I am sad today, neighbour. My wife is ill. <laughs> but I thought it was your donkey that was sick. Yes, it is really. But I'm letting myself get used to the shock by easy stages. His Excellency. By a series of misunderstandings and coincidences, Nasruddin found himself one day in the audience hall of the Emperor of Persia. The Shah and Shah was surrounded by self-seeking nobles, governors of provinces, courtiers and connivers of all kinds. Each was pressing his own claim to be appointed head of the embassy which was soon to set out for India. The emperor's patience was at an end and he raised his head from the importunate mass mentally invoking the aid of heaven in his problem as to whom to choose. His eyes lighted upon Mullah Nasruddin. This is to be the ambassador, he announced. So now, leave me in peace. Nasruddin was given rich clothes and an enormous chest of rubies, diamonds, emeralds and priceless works of art was entrusted to him. The gift of the Shah and Shah to the great mogul. The courtiers, however, were not finished. United for once by this affront to their claims, they decided to encompass the downfall of the Muller. First, they broke into his quarters and stole the jewels, which they divided amongst themselves, replacing them with earth to make up the weight. Then they called upon Nasruddin, determined to ruin his embassy, to get him into trouble, and in the process to discredit their master as well. Congratulations, great Nasruddin, they said. What the fountain of wisdom, peacock of the world, has ordered must be the essence of all wisdom. We therefore hail you. But there are just a couple of points upon which we may be able to advise you, accustomed as we are to the behavior of diplomatic emissaries. I, I, I should be obliged if you would tell me, said Nasruddin. Very well, said the chief of the intriguers. The first thing is that you must be humble. In order to show how modest you are, therefore, you should not show any signs of importance. When you reach India, you will enter as many mosques as you can and make collections for yourself. The second thing is that you must observe court etiquette in the country to which you are accredited. This will mean that you will refer to the great mogul as the full moon. But is that not a title of the Persian emperor? Not in India. So Nasruddin set out. The Persian emperor told him, as they took leave, Be careful, Nasruddin, adhere to etiquette, for the Mughal is a mighty emperor, and we must impress him while not affronting him in any way. I am well prepared, majesty, said Nasruddin. As soon as he entered the territory of India, Nasruddin went into a mosque and mounted the pulpit. Oh, people, he cried, see in me the representative of the shadow of Allah upon earth, the axis of the globe. Bring your money, for I am making a collection. This he repeated in every mosque he could find, all the way from Baluchistan to Imperial Delhi. He collected a great deal of money. Do with it. 
the counselor had said. What you will, for it is the product of intuitive growth and bestowal, and as such, its use will create its own demand. All that they wanted to happen was for the mullah to be exposed to ridicule for collecting money in this shameless manner. The holy must leave from their holiness, roared Nasruddin at mosque after mosque. I give no account, nor do I expect any. To you, money is something to be hoarded after being sought. You can exchange it for material things. To me, it is part of a mechanism. I am the representative of a natural force of intuitive growth, bestowal, and disbursement. Now, as we all know, good often proceeds from apparent evil and the reverse. Those who thought that Nasruddin was lining his own pockets did not contribute. For some reason, their affairs did not prosper. Those who were considered credulous and gave their money became in a mysterious way enriched. But to return to our story. Sitting on the peacock throne, the emperor at Delhi studied the reports which curious were daily bringing him, describing the progress of the Persian ambassador. At first, he could make no sense out of them. Then he called his council together. Gentlemen, he said, this Nasruddin must indeed be a saint or a divinely guided one. Who ever heard anyone else of violating the principle that one does not seek money without a plausible reason, lest a wrong interpretation be placed upon one's motives? May your shadow never grow less, they replied. Oh, infinite extension of all wisdom, oh, we agree. If there are men like these in Persia, we must beware, for their moral ascendancy over our materialistic outlook is plain. Then a runner arrived from Persia with a secret letter in which the Mughal spies at the imperial court reported, Mullah Nasruddin is a man of no consequence in Persia. He was chosen absolutely at random to be ambassador. We cannot fathom the reason for the Shah and Shah not being more selective. The Mughal called his council together. Incomparable birds of paradise, he told them. A thought has manifested itself to me. The Persian emperor has chosen a man at random to represent his whole nation. This may mean that he is so confident of the consistent quality of his people that for him, anyone at all is qualified to undertake the delicate task of ambassador to the sublime court of Delhi. This indicates the degree of perfection attained, the amazingly infallible intuitive powers cultivated amongst them. We must reconsider our desire to invade Persia, for such a people could easily engulf our arms. Their society is organized on a different basis from our own. You are right, superlative warrior on the frontiers, cried the Indian nobles. At length, Nasruddin arrived in Delhi. He was riding his old donkey and was followed by his escort, weighed down by the sacks of money which he had collected in the mosques. The treasure chest was mounted on an elephant, such was its size and weight. Nasruddin was met by the master of ceremonies at the gate of Delhi. The emperor was seated with his nobles in an immense courtyard, the reception hall of the ambassadors. This had been so arranged that the entrance was low. As a consequence, ambassadors were always obliged to dismount from their horses and enter the supreme presence on foot, giving the impressions of supplicants. Only an equal could ride into the presence of an emperor. No ambassador had ever arrived 
astride a donkey. And thus, there was nothing to stop Nasruddin trotting straight through the door and up to the imperial dice. The Indian king and his courtier exchanged meaningful glances at this act. Nasruddin blithely dismounted, addressed the king as the full moon, and called for his treasure chest to be brought. When it was opened, and the earth revealed, there was a moment of consternation. <laughs> I had better say nothing, thought Nasruddin, for there is nothing to say which could mitigate this. So he remained silent. The Mughal whispered to his vizier, What does this mean? Is this an insult to the highest eminence? Incapable of believing this, the vizier thought furiously. Then he provided the interpretation. It is a symbolic act, a presence, he murmured. The ambassador means that he acknowledges you as the master of the earth. Did he not call you the full moon? The mogul relaxed. We are content with the offering of the Persian Shahin Shah, for we have no need of wealth, and we appreciate the metaphysical subtlety of the message. I had been told to say, said Nasruddin, remembering the essential gift-offering phrase given him by the intriguers in Persia, that this is all we have for your majesty. That means that Persia will not yield one further ounce of her soil to us, whispered the interpreter of omens to the king. Tell your master that we understand, smiled the mogul. But there is one other point. If I am the full moon, what is the Persian emperor? Uh, he is the new moon, Nasruddin said automatically. The full moon is more mature and gives more light than the new moon, which is its junior whispered the court astrologer to the mogul. We are content, said the delighted Indian. You may return to Persia and tell the new moon that the full moon salutes him. The Persian spies at the court of Delhi immediately sent a complete account of this interchange to the Shah and Shah. They added that it was known that the Mughal emperor had been impressed and feared to plan war against the Persians because of the activities of Nasruddin. When the mullah returned home, the Shah and Shah received him in full audience. I am more than pleased, friend Nasruddin, he said, at the result of your uh, unorthodox methods. Our country is saved, and this means that there will be no attempt at accounting for the jewels or the collecting in mosques. You are henceforth to be known by the special title of Safir, emissary. But, your majesty, hissed the vizier, this man is guilty of high treason, if not more. We have perfect evidence that he applied one of your titles to the Emperor of India, thus changing his allegiance and bringing one of your magnificent attributes into disrepute. Yes, thundered the Shah and Shah. The sages have said wisely that to every perfection there is an imperfection. Nasruddin, why did you call me the new moon? I don't know much about protocol, said Nasruddin, but I do know that the full moon is about to wane, and the new moon is still growing with its greatest glories ahead of it. The emperor's mood changed. 
Seize Anwar, the Grand Vizier, he roared. Mullah, I offer you the position of Grand Vizier. <coughs> what, said Nasiruddin? Could I accept, after seeing with my own eyes, what happened to my predecessor? And what happened to the jewels and treasures which the evil courtiers had usurped from the treasure chest? That is another story. As the incomparable Nasruddin said, only children and the stupid see cause and effect in the same story.